Good morning, or good evening, or good night, wherever you happen to be. My name is Damien, the tall, friendly atheist dad from the Tall, Friendly Atheist Dad podcast. Welcome to part one of An Atheist Reads on the Jews and Their Lies by Martin Luther. It is a pleasure today to have two guests with me. Firstly, I'll introduce you to Jax. Well, actually, no, I'll let Jax introduce herself. <laughs> Jax, introduce yourself. Hey everyone, I go by Jax or that126 on TikTok. I do a lot of stuff on things that I've been reading recently with little sprinkles of atheism and my cats thrown in there for funsies. No worries. And on the other, uh, also over there is Lewis Ungert. Lewis, introduce yourself. I am Lewis Ungert. I am an author and a tweeter. You can find me on Twitter at I am Ungert. And you can check out my book for free download right now at Lewis Ungert dot com and uh, thanks for having me on you're welcome hey lewis i don't hear you're just a tweeter i hear you're a legendary tweeter i am a legendary tweeter that's true <laughs> <laughs> there you go don't, don't don't play it down buddy hype it up hype it up anyway so today we are reading on the jews and their lies by martin luther written in 1543 um this is part of a series of historical books that i'm reading with special guests um, uh, if you if you go to the Tall Friendly Atheist Dad podcast YouTube channel, you'll also find Bible Defense of Slavery, uh, The People of the Abyss, and also Christian Slaveholders Disobedient to Christ. Uh, you'll also find some more contemporary stuff. Uh, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Frank Turek. Uh, Letter to a Christian Nation by Sam Harris. And what else was I, what else was I reading? Um, oh, Total Life Prosperity by Creflo A. Dollar. That's a, um, Lewis, you, I really, I would really love to get your opinion on that particular book. Wait, which book is that? Uh, Total Life Prosperity by Creflo Dollar. <laughs> I think it's basically a Christian, the secret. Uh, I don't, I don't know if you remember the secret from, uh, yeah. from about a decade ago. Um, yeah. I'm very familiar. So, okay. Well, in that case, both of you go check it out and see if I'm, see if I'm wrong in my assessment. <laughs> Anyway, so um, I'm, ge I'm guessing you're right. I probably have all the same criticisms of Creflo Dollar that you do. His his <laughs> name his name kind of says it all. So, uh, and, and also if I t if I tell you that he is a disciple of Kenny Copeland, that oh may no, also that may also seal the deal. But anyway, um, so uh, we are reading on the Jews and their lies. Um, this is the this is from the very start, and there is a little preface that we are going to read. So, so basically, what we're going to do is we're going to read some uh, read some stuff. We're going to add some comments. Uh, Jax and I are on the atheist side of the bait, and Lewis is a degree qualified Christian. So he he will add his uh, expert opinion on uh, on what it is that Martin Luther wrote in the last part of his life. When he was apparently very cantankerous. Yes. But anyway, let's see how let's see how cantankerous he gets. So from the from the preface in three, two, one, with a click of the fingers. At the beginning of his career, it is often said that Luther was apparently sympathetic to Jewish resistance to the Catholic Church. He wrote early in his career. The Jews are blood relations of our Lord. If it were proper to boast of flesh and blood, the Jews belong more to Christ than we. I beg, therefore, my dear papist, if you become tired of abusing me as a heretic, that you begin to revile me as a Jew. However, some time before 1517, in his letters, in his letters to Spalatin, we can already see that Luther's hatred of Jews, best seen in this 1543 letter, was not some affectation of old age, but was present very early on. Luther expected Jews to convert to his purified Christianity. When they did not, he turned violently against them. It is impossible for modern people to read the horrible passages below and not to think of the burning of synagogues in November 1938 on Kristallnacht, nor, nor would one wish to excuse Luther for this text. A number of points must, however, be made. The most important concerns the language used. Luther used violent and vulgar language throughout his career. He was not a man to say manure when he meant shit. We do not expect religious figures to use this sort of language in the modern world, but it was not uncommon in the early 16th century. Second, although Luther's comments seemed to be proto-Nazi, 
they are better seen as part of tradition of medieval Christian anti-Semitism. While there is little doubt that Christian anti-Semitism lay the social and cultural basis for modern anti-Semitism, modern anti-Semitism does differ in being based on pseudo-scientific notions of race. The Nazis imprisoned and killed Jews who had converted to Christianity. Luther would have welcomed them. None of this justifies what follows, but it may help to comprehend what is being written here. Guys, uh, what thoughts do you have just listening to that? Um, I thought it was a helpful intro. Um, I don't know if I would agree with um, what he says about letters of Spalatin, but um, I do. I do think that um, it is accurate that he. Um, didn't have this kind of violent language as early in his career. And I do mm -hmm. think it's helpful to understand that um, the kind of the um, vulgarity and violence of this letter, which seems completely unhinged, was actually fairly common in the day. Um, and uh, we talked about this a bit off air, but I, I think it's helpful to know that you know in that day, they talked a lot different than we would expect Christians or even like intellectual you know the other thing to keep in mind about martin luther is this is a guy that was a professor and was you know very very well studied a, a mm -hmm. um an academic of the day so it, it's something we wouldn't expect a professor to write like this or whatever but it it just was a different period in time and and they certainly talk different and you you read language like this coming from kings and you read language coming from even like saints of the catholic church has uh canonized um there, mm -hmm. all, many of them have similar language to this, not necessarily about the Jews, but just about each other. Oh, indeed, in indeed, and, and, you know, and, and, and I, <laughs> indeed, and I actually find the the evolution of culture very, very interesting. Um, just the fact that you know, like, if I walked into a church and said, you know, shit, um, yeah. be, like everyone would look at me like, you know, you've just you 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 know, you, you, you're a friend of the devil, basically. Whereas mm -hmm. in these times, um, it was I think I think it was almost like if you don't if you don't swear, you know, what's wrong with you? Yeah, yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> anyway, anyway, Jax, could I get you to start with the first few paragraphs for me? Um, I will, but want to add a couple of things real quick. Oh, of course, um, yes. So first of all. As someone, we talked about this off air a little bit, but as someone who was raised in the Lutheran church, in Lutheran private schools, this part of Luther was never really shown or discussed. It, we, mm -hmm. There was the 99 theses that we would cover, but that was mm -hmm. about it. We wouldn't really go too far into his life beyond the bare bones basics of what he did for the church, but not actually of the person. So... I think this will be definitely interesting and at least a little bit more educational than what I got <laughs> growing up. And, and, indeed, uh, indeed. This is – sorry, it was, yes. Can I say one other thing is that sometimes um, when you look at kind of revolutionaries in history, and I think whatever you think of Martin Luther, he was mm -hmm. a revolutionary, right? Like he made mm -hmm. a indeed. giant change in history. Um, sometimes people – that do that have to be a little bit cantankerous. Otherwise, if they were go along to get along kind of people, um, they wouldn't they wouldn't be the person to lead a a major change. And so he certainly was a person that was, you know, I like the manure. He wasn't somebody to say manure when he meant shit. Um, <laughs> like that, he he was that type of person, which um for better or worse, allowed him to do what he did, which was um kind of this major transformation within the church and not just the church but i mean the western civilization as a whole really mm -hmm. changed in in great part after I, martin luther so i, I, I did I, I, worth noting. and i think i think history does owe him a uh, a, a great debt uh, mm -hmm. as well I, and obviously the the protestant movement owes him a great debt but it is interesting that you know um i think you kind of made the point there was that you know um historical figures uh, are flawed like there is no perfect person in Everyone's history. flawed. Yep, um, uh, I'm sure Lewis can name one notable exception to that, but um, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there, there was a particular Jew who lived um, about two thousand yes. years ago. Like that. <laughs> That's right. But yeah, um, Jax, could you continue, please? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
I had made up my mind to write no more either about the Jews or against them. But since I learned that those miserable and accursed people do not cease to lure to themselves even us, that is the Christians. I have published this little book so that I might be found among those who opposed such poisonous activities of the Jews and who warned the Christians to be on their guard against them. I would not have believed that a Christian could be duped by the Jews into taking their exile and wretchedness upon himself. However, the devil is the god of the world, and wherever God's word is absent, he has an easy task, not only with the weak, but also with the strong. May God help us. Amen. Wow, that is oh, one, like two, two sentences in. He's already, you know, <laughs> yeah, those miserable and accursed people. Oh, so wow. That, and I would not have believed that a Christian could be duped by the Jews into taking their exile. It's like, you were right, Lewis, you know, this guy, this guy really did have a, um, you know, a way with words. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it is very important to note. Um, when we, you know, we live in the post World War II world where obviously it was this horrific um, treatment of the Jews that we still have images for and we remember and mm -hmm. all that. Um, it's worth noting that he certainly would have said the same thing about papists. He certainly would have said the same, you know, papists being his word for uh, Catholic people. He certainly mm -hmm. would have said the same thing for, you know, him and, um, uh, Pagans. Ara Erasmus, yeah, and, and right, any other denomination. So his concern is not a racial concern, as that intro stated. It's he was very concerned about Christian um, doctrine and making sure that people didn't get deceived by what he viewed as false teaching. So that appears to be his primary concern here. But he using that word Jews, it's hard for us in our 21st century world to see that as anything but a reflection of nazism which is it was a different concern than that kind of uh, pseudo-scientific racism it, it, like that, and, this, and, and this is one of the things that i this is one of the things that i did have to consider when reading the book was that you know um well actually uh, before you came on uh came on here uh, me and jacks we were discussing there was a few books that we were discussing and one of those was called the the secret relationship between blacks and jews by the nation of islam and it's like, well, you know, like if you think this is if you think this is a little <laughs> bit anti anti Semitic, like I'm sure that you know uh, what this the was a of lesser of the evils. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, anyway, Jack's going to get you to read the next couple of paragraphs. So, sorry to interrupt you. No, you're fine. <clears throat> Go for it. Grace and peace in the Lord, dear sir and good friend. I have received a treatise in which a Jew engages in dialogue with a Christian. He dares to pervert the scriptural passages which we cite in testimony to our faith concerning our Lord Christ and Mary, his mother, and to interpret them quite differently. With this argument, he thinks he can destroy the basis of our faith. This is my reply to you and to him. It is not my purpose to quarrel with the Jews, nor to learn from them how they interpret or understand scripture. I know all of that very well already. Much less do I propose to convert the Jews, for that is impossible. Those two excellent men, Lyra and Bergen, Bergensis, Bergensis? Yep, Bergensis, yep. Bergensis, together with others, truthfully described the Jews' vile interpretation for us 200 and 100 years ago, respectively. Indeed, they refuted it thoroughly. However, this was no help at all to the Jews, and they have grown steadily worse. Okay, uh, Lewis, would you have any idea? Well, actually, well, so Jack as well. Do you have any idea what he means by 200, 100 years ago, respectively? I believe that he's quoting two previous Christian apologists. Um, I don't know who they are, but it looks like Lyra and Bergenzis both wrote, um, engaged with Jewish people about making the Christian argument. And apparently he likes their arguments, but he doesn't think it convinced anybody. So, no. Fair enough. Could I get you to read the next couple, next couple paragraphs, please, Lewis? Sure. I'm not as good a reader as Jax, but I will do my best. So. <laughs> you will. You will. 
and of course I just lost my place. But um, hold on just a second. The two they failed to learn. Worse. Okay, they have failed to learn any lesson from the terrible distress that has been theirs for over fourteen hundred years in exile. Nor can they obtain any end or definite terminus of this, as they suppose by means of the vehement cries and laments to God. If these blows do not help, it is reasonable to assume that our taking and explaining will help even less. Therefore, wow. okay. keep going. Keep therefore, going. Sorry, I'm just... <laughs> therefore, a Christian should be content and not argue with the Jews. But if you have to or want to talk to them, do not say any more than this. Listen, Jew, are you aware that Jerusalem and your sovereignty together with your temple and priesthood have been destroyed for over 1,460 years. And this year, which we Christians write as the year 1542, since the birth of Christ is exactly 1,468 years, going on 1,500 years since Vespasian and Titus destroyed Jerusalem and expelled the Jews from the city. Let the Jews bite on this nut. And dispute <laughs> this question as long as they wish. Oh, God. That is, sorry, Liz. That, that is. We were warned. Just, we were warned he doesn't we, mince words. No. <laughs> Oh, boy. Let, 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 I might use that. I might use that as an insult myself. Um, yeah, bite on this nut. Yes. Um, but yeah, <laughs> this is. This is like yeah. He's really just getting stuck in. But like. Like, I hadn't read the book uh, previously, so I'm just like, this is all coming new to me now. And, like, when you were saying, you know, but if you have to or want to talk with them, do not say any more than this. <laughs> I, I knew something was was coming up. <laughs> and yeah. it's sort of like, it, it's sort of like, um, it, it's a little bit like um, making fun of an Australian because Australia was started as as a con as a penal colony. You know, it's like using like it's like making fun of the Jews because like fifteen hundred years ago, you know, you lost your nation, ha ha ha. Um, that's kind of how that's kind of how I see it. It's sort of like you know, you're reminding like trying to put him down because of something that happened, you know, to his ancestors, like you know, his ancestors like thirty generations up or something. Yeah. Now it's worth um, if I could interject a little bit of Luther's of, of course. theology. Um, so Go Luther believed that suffering would lead you to Christ. So Luther mm -hmm. believed that um, as we go through trials, his own conversion came at a moment of fear and trembling, um, kind of famous conversion story of um, getting caught in uh, a horrible lightning storm, thinking he was going to die and converting. So he believed, and, and this was, a very common medieval Catholic view and a modern Catholic view is that suffering often leads us to um, kind of bow before for God. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know that he's necessarily like, ha ha, look what happened to you. I think he's saying, Hey, you've struggled all these years and, and you're still not, you're still not going to, you know, bow okay. before God. So I think that's kind of what he's saying there. If I understand what his point is, is that yeah. it's more, um, it's more, Hey, all this suffering, you still don't get it. You know, that kind of, that kind of thing. So. No, fair enough. Okay. Um, I'll continue next, next couple of paragraphs myself then. <clears throat> For such ruthless wrath of God is sufficient evidence that they assuredly have erred and gone astray. Even a child can comprehend this. For one dare not regard God as so cruel that he would punish his own people so long, so terribly, so unmercifully, and in addition keep silent, comfort, comforting, comforting them neither with words nor with deeds, and fixing no time limit and no end to it. Who would have, who would have faith, hope, or love towards such a God? Therefore, this work of wrath is proof that the Jews surely rejected by God, are no longer his people, and neither is he any longer their God. This is in accord with Hosea 1.9. Call his name, not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. <clears throat> yes, unfortunately, this is their lot, truly a terrible one. They may interpret this as they will. We, will see, uh, we see the facts before our eyes, and these do not deceive us. If there were but a spark of reasoning or understanding in them, 
they would surely say to themselves, O oh Lord God, something has gone wrong with us. Our misery is too great, too long, too severe. God has forgotten us, etc. To be sure, I am not a Jew, but I really do not like to contemplate God's awful wrath toward this people. It sends a shudder of fear through body and soul. For I ask, what will the eternal wrath of God in hell be like towards false Christians and all unbelievers? Well, let the Jews regard our Lord as they, Lord Jesus as they will. We behold the fulfillment of the words spoken by him in Luke 21.20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. For these are days of vengeance. For great distress shall be upon the earth and wrath upon this people. In short, as has already been said, do not engage much in debate with the Jews about the articles of our faith. From their youth, they have been so nurtured with venom and rancor against our Lord that there is no hope until they reach the point where their misery finally makes them pliable and they are forced to confess that the Messiah has come and that he is our Jesus. Until such a time, it is much too early. Yes, it is useless to argue with them about how God is triune, how he became man, and how Mary is the mother of God. No human reason, nor any human heart, will ever grant these things, much less the embittered, venomous, blind heart of the Jews. As has already been said, what God cannot reform with such cruel blows, we will be unable to change with words and works. Moses was unable to reform the Pharaoh by means of plagues, miracles, pleas, or threats. He had to let him drown in the sea. Wow, that's a. Uh, I, I I think I think I, I think I can see a point now, Lewis, where um the the Catholic idea of uh, suffering as the as the path to God, and yeah, where he says that you know um if the fact that you know that they've been desolate from their land hasn't made them see the truth, then what will our words do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, and um, it's worth worth noting in um. The biography I think I mentioned to you guys off air um, is called Luther, Man Between God and the Devil by um, Hiko Oberman. That's a famous biography of him. Um, okay. And in there, he talks um, a bit about Luther's history with the Jews. But one of the things that he talks about is that Luther tried very, very hard uh, for a long time to convert his Jewish friends um, and kind of failed. So I think mm -hmm. part of his statements here are from personal experience where he's like, I, I tried really hard and it didn't work, you know, kind of, kind of thing. So if, if that makes sense to give some context to his own, uh, I guess, rant here. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Rant, that's, rant, uh, yeah. I think, I think, rant, I think rant, I think rant is a very good word. Uh, Jax, <laughs> Jax, do you have any, do you have any thoughts to add or to answer that? Um, I mostly wanted to talk about that last sentence. Moses was unable to reform the Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Now I don't know all the bi all the versions of the Bible that talk about this, all the different translations, but I know several of the one of the translations that I'm familiar with have it say that God was the one who hardened Pharaoh's heart, not necessarily that the Pharaoh himself was in control of that. Mm -hmm. So, Lewis. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> um. In regards to that, it, do you think that um, that Luther is accurate on this on that statement that Pharaoh had control over that, or is, am I missing something? Um, yeah, so I think um, when and that I'm looking for the quotation that actually comes from Paul and I Saint Paul, and I believe it's in Romans chapter nine. Um, but I, the the statement that Paul uses that God hardened Moses's heart. Um, is something Christians talk a lot about. And it's, there's, and actually Damien and I have had a few conversations on this where there is an element, <laughs> there's an element of, um, of kind of the bad choices we make and the temptations that we have that God certainly allows. And I think as um, m my own interpretation of that idea that God hardened Pharaoh's heart is that, 
we as human beings kind of can have two responses to the actions of God. One is to soften our heart and one is to harden our heart. So when God presents us with struggles, for example, some people as you know, some people bow down before God and some people become harder and bitter towards God. And so in a sense, God both offers the opportunity of hardening our hearts and softening our hearts. Um, so that's how I would interpret that. Um, it's, I agree, Jax, that's a hard in, uh, question. And I, But I don't think God hardening our heart takes away our free will on it. I, so in other words, I, I think God can harden our heart in the same way, you know, when you, I guess, pound a piece of metal, it can become harder or you can poke a hole through it one or the other, right? Like it just depends on um, how, what type of metal that is and how it responds. So um, I don't know. So that's, that's my own take. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and I think, uh, Jax, you having a, a very strong Lutheran background uh, would have a unique insight into uh, into this. I suppose I'll ask: in your in your upbringing and in your faith walk uh, that you had, did, would you have any idea that Luth, Luther wrote stuff like this? Um, in terms of, I'm more aware of the. Um, of the small catechism and the large catechism. I know Luther helped write one of them, but mm -hmm. it's been a minute. <laughs> it's been like two minutes since I studied that in yeah. depth. But um, I know that um, obviously here, Luther was of the mind that, you know, free will was a huge thing. Um, even for a lot of Lutherans, free will is a huge talking point. And so it makes sense to see Luther talking about how fit, how Pharaoh's heart kind of hardened itself in a way, but it's that was a conversation that we were never allowed to have. Was was that story? That was a story that we, growing up, I was never allowed to debate that because. But Lewis, as you said, it's a very hard conversation, and there's still debate going on in some parts of different denominations of what does that mean. Sure. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um. Shall I continue, or would someone else? Would someone else like to read? Why don't you uh, keep at it, Damien? You're no, that's, that's fine, that's fine, that's it. No, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, uh, where were we? Okay, here we go. Now, in order, to, in order to strengthen our faith, we want to deal with a few crass follies of the Jews in their belief and in their exegesis of the scriptures, since they so maliciously revile our faith. If this should move any Jew to reform and repent, so much the better. We are now not talking with the Jews, but about their Jews and their dealings, so that our Germans too might be informed. Oh, okay. Um, oh, sorry, just noticed it. Ah, sorry. <laughs> you, you're back, you're back, cool. Um, there is one thing about which they boast and pride themselves beyond measure, and that is their descent from the foremost people on earth, from Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, and from the twelve patriarchs, and thus from the holy people of Israel. St. Paul himself admits this when he says in Romans 9, Romans 9, 5, Coram Patres, that is, to them belongs the patriarchs, and of their race is the Christ, etc. And Christ himself declares in John 4, 22, salvation is from the Jews. Therefore, they boast of being the noblest, yes, the only noble people on earth. In comparison with them and in their eyes, we Gentiles, Goyim, are not human. In fact, we hardly deserve to be considered poor worms by them. For we are not of that high and noble blood, lineage, birth and descent. This is their argument. And indeed, I think it is the greatest and strongest reason for their pride and boasting. <laughs> Do any of you actually have any... Listen, would any of you actually know why Luther would say that the Jews consider us as, uh, you know... Um, what, what has he got here? Uh, that we deserve to be considered poor worms by them. Because my understanding is that... 
the uh, Jewish theology wasn't, how can I say, well, like medieval Jewish theology wasn't too antagonistic towards outsiders. How correct is that from your guys' understanding? I, I will say from my end, I do not know to what extent there was, um, I guess, Jewish supremacy or any kind of thought like that in the Middle Ages. I, I have honestly no idea. I would imagine that like all cultures and races, people sometimes think themselves better than others, but I mm -hmm, don't, mm -hmm. I have, I have no idea to what extent that was a problem uh, among the people that Martin Luther was dealing with or how unfair that statement is. I'm, I'm guessing based on the tone of this overall thing that there's a lot more nuance that could be added to <laughs> their, their attitudes that he's not including there, but uh, I, I can't answer that question. I don't know, Jax, maybe you know. Uh, I don't know specifically about Luther and his um, close group of friends that were Jewish or the Jewish community in his area at the time. But um, one phrase that I was taught, and I could be very, very wrong. Mm -hmm. um, one phrase I was taught was, if you have two Jewish people in the room, there's going to be three different uh, <laughs> denominations of thought amongst them. Which... Yeah. Again, I don't know how accurate that is, so forgive me if that is a bad if that is a bad take. But I yeah. personally in modern times in modern times, I've not really seen that kind of thinking from Jewish people or that kind of um, means of communicating. Um, there are several people I follow on Twitter that are either rabbis or very much in their Jewish faith and they've been nothing but kind and open so i don't know what it was like for luther at his time but it's possible he was just a cantankerous dick waffle and just <laughs> was willing to antagonize or if it was he genuinely was just frustrated with the situation and was ready to throw hands okay because i'm also wondering whether he's uh and i'm sure lewis will uh get where i'm coming from with this it's a bit like, let's say Luther found, let's say maybe like a couple of scholars and, you know, found that these Jewish scholars were antagonistic towards the Goyim. It's a little bit like me get, uh, getting Kent Hovind and taking him to be representative of all Christian slash Christian mm -hmm. thought. So I'm just wondering if he's gone. Like, it's, it's a bit like me like making a, a, a video or a podcast series about Kent Hovind and saying, "Look how dumb Christians are. You know that they deserve what what happens to them." Whereas Kent Hovind, you know, um, represents a you know a minority of, of Christian thought, e even within the creationist movement. Um, mm. You know, mm. yeah. So I, I just wonder. I, sorry, I would I would imagine that. Um... Martin Luther did have some sort of experiences with the people around him that he is unfairly projecting on all Jewish people. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure, I'm sure he's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's part of that that's going on. Mm -hmm. Not fair. Okay. Um, it kind of, like it kind of reminds me of my grandma. Um, she had one incident, uh, when she was slowly going into her Alzheimer's dementia that, ultimately changed how she viewed um some people and so it's that's very possible good point lewis yeah no fair enough okay um i will continue then therefore god has to endure that in their synagogues their prayers songs <coughs> doctrines and their whole life they come and stand before him and plague him grievously if I may speak of God in such a human fashion. Thus, he must listen to their boasts and their praises to him for setting them apart from the Gentiles, for letting them be descended from the holy patriarchs, and for selecting them to be holy and peculiar people, etc. And there is no limit and no end to this boasting about their descent and their physical birth from the fathers. And to fill the measure of their raving, mad and stupid folly, they boast and they thank God in the first place because they were created as human beings and not as animals. In the second place, because they are Israelites and not Goyim, Gentiles. In the third place, because they were created as males and not as females. 
Did they not learn such tomfoolery from Israel, but from the Goyim? For history records that the Greek Plato daily accorded God such praise and thanksgiving. If such arrogance and blasphemy may be termed praise of God, this man, too, praised his gods for these three items, that he was a human being and not an animal, a male and not a female, a Greek and not a non-Greek or barbarian. This is a fool's boast, the gratitude of a barbarian who blasphemes God. Similarly, the Italians fancy themselves the only human beings. They imagine that all other people in the world are non-humans, mere ducks or mice, by comparison. Hmm. Why? So, um, what? What? This so us. Why would he mention the Italians in this way? Do you think? Well, can I, can I jump back a real quick second? Of, um, of course. So, um, there's a. Uh, He's referring to a specific Jewish prayer there. There's actually a famous Jewish prayer that's, I believe, I'm trying to remember which document it is, but it is something that's very commonly prayed in Jewish synagogues. It says something along the lines of, and I'm trying to Google it here as we're talking, but I, I think it says, mm -hmm. blessed are you, Lord, our creator, who has not created me. Has, has, boy, I'm trying to... Um, yeah, it basically says something exactly along those lines that you made me a man or you made me a man, not an animal, that you made me a Jew, not a Gentile, that you made me a man, not a female. So like like that is it's, it's part of the daily prayers of some particular, you know, um, some Jewish common okay, prayer. All right. That's right. So he, he's thanks he's, for he's, ignoring the women in that prayer, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and then. So, yeah, and then I think what he's doing is he's he's saying, okay, so there's this racial superiority that they have, Jewish people have, and then yeah. he's comparing that to the racial superiority that I guess maybe he thinks Italians had. He had traveled to Rome, so maybe he also experienced that in Rome. I, I'm not sure. So. Okay, no, fair enough. I, I just wonder if he used the word, if, if this word Italians was translated from something to really mean Romans. Or, or, or Rome itself, you know, or as a representative of the Catholic Church. As possible. Yeah, that's a good uh, good possibility. I'm, I'm actually not sure, though. No, fair enough. Okay, um, I shall continue. No one can take away from them their pride concerning their blood and their descent from Israel. In the Old <clears throat> Testament, they lost many a battle in wars over this matter, though no Jew understands this. All the prophets censured them for it, for it betrays an arrogant, carnal <coughs> presumption, devoid of spirit and faith. They were also slain and persecuted for this reason. St. John the Baptist took them to task severely because of it, saying, Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I tell you, God is, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Matthew 3.9 he did not call them Abraham's children, but a brood of vipers, Matthew 3, 7. Oh, that was too insulting for the noble blood and race of Israel, and they declared, He has a demon, Matthew eleven eighteen. Our Lord also calls them a brood of vipers. Furthermore, in John three thirty nine, he states, If you are Abraham's children, uh, sorry, if you are Abraham's children would do what Abraham did, you are of your father, the devil. It was intolerable to them to hear that they were not Abraham's, but the devil's children. Nor can they bear to hear this today. If they should surrender this boast and argument, their whole system, which is built on it, would topple and change. Question. Yes. Would the Christian faith exist if the original Jewish documents, the original five books of the Bible were not made. Wow, this is a, that's a, bit of a, that's a bit of a deep question. I think uh, well, if they were never made or if they just don't exist anymore. If they were never made to begin with, if the Jewish Ooh. faith never existed, would Christianity still be here? I'm going to say no, because to me, Christianity is a clear revision of of uh of judaism and i think i made the um, i think i made the snippy remark to you the other day that uh christianity is judaism 2.0 oh 
Um, and I actually would 100% agree with you, Damien. I believe um, if you, uh, there's some great scholarship on this, but if you read, um, for <laughs> example, um, N.T. Wright's um, Christian Origins series, New Testament and the People of God and, and Jesus and the Victory of God, he talks about how deeply Jewish all Jesus's teachings are um, and mm -hmm. how they can really only be understood in light of the Old Testament and how often he's quoting, referencing, acting out passages from the uh, book of Exodus, from the book of Deuteronomy. Um, in so much of what he does as a teacher, he's kind of living that out. So I think it's very, very much built upon um, the experience that the people of Israel went through in those first five books, as well as you mm -hmm. know, through through the rest of the Old Testament. Yep. And it's, I think Jesus viewed his his own ministry as the um, fulfillment of the Old Testament, um, what Christians mm -hmm. call the Old Testament. So, yes. So and, uh, the reason I, think, I uh, uh, you go. So, okay, sorry. I was going to say the reason I bring this up is because Martin Luther is just going ham on <laughs> Jewish people, and I'm just sitting here thinking, you wouldn't would would you would you have the same faith? If, if these people didn't exist. Yeah. And I think what he's saying, um, and, um, as I read this, um, I think what he's, he's objecting to the Jewish people claiming racial superiority. And again, we can mm -hmm. talk about whether they believed that or not, but he's, he's saying you don't have the right to claim that because you're a, an ethnic descendant of Abraham, which is, you know, what the, the Jewish people claim, mm -hmm. um, you don't have the right to say that you have special access to God. And then what he's quoting at various points is times that Jesus, who was ethnically Jewish, um, and Martin Luther acknowledges that at the beginning of this, but the number of times that Jesus says something similar to that, right? So mm -hmm. Jesus at very, at various points, Jesus says, hey, I'm going to raise up people that are not just Jewish, but Gentiles as well, or at least mm -hmm. alludes to that. And the Jewish people are like, well, we're the children of Abraham. And actually, Jesus has one verse where he says, well, if God don't don't fall back on that, Jesus says, he says, God, God can raise up children out of these stones. Mm -hmm. um, so so basically, Martin Luther's kind of quoting, almost quoting Jesus to them of like, hey, don't count on your ethnicity to save you before God, that um, there's actually you know, that that won't help you. That you know, it's, it's not about ethnicity. It's not about race. So uh -huh. it's, yeah, it's yeah. kind of what he's saying there. And just to extend on your point there, Jax, um, there will probably there will probably be no Islam either if there was no if there was no <clears throat> Judaism. Religion and history are complicated. <laughs> but oh, hey, oh, so, oh, so fascinating. Oh, so fascinating. Hey, yes, can I just add a quick footnote? Um, the, oh, yes. um, the Jewish prayer book is called the Siddur, and it has that <laughs> prayer. And um, it it's a long prayer, so I'm not going to read it all, but it does um, have those lines that he's referencing there. So it's okay. S-I-D-D-U-R. Can you link it in the private? Can you link in the private chat? Sure. Do that, and then I can. Uh, yeah, this time if I oh, there you go. I, oh, thank you, Jax. You've already you've already kind of you're geez, you're head of the game. <laughs> I'm fast. You are. Um, okay, where where were we? I hold where... that if they're Messiah. Thank you very much. I hold that if their Messiah, for whom they hope, should come and do away with their boast and its basis, they will crucify and blaspheme him seven times worse than they did our Messiah. And they would also say that he was not the true Messiah, but a deceiving devil. For they have portrayed their Messiah to themselves as one who would strengthen and increase such carnal and arrogant error regarding nobility of blood and lineage. That is the same as saying that he should assist them in blaspheming God and in viewing his creatures with disdain, including the women who are also human beings and the image of God, as well as we. Moreover, they are our own flesh and blood, such as mother, sister, daughter, housewives, etc. For in accordance with the aforementioned threefold song of praise, they do not hold Sarah 
as a woman, to be as noble as Abraham as a man. Perhaps they wish to honour themselves for being born half noble of a noble father and half ignoble of an ignoble mother. But enough of this tomfoolery and trickery. We propose to discuss their argument and boast and prove convincingly before God and the world, not before the Jews. For, as already said, they would accept this neither from Moses, Moses nor from their Messiah himself, that their argument is quite empty and stands condemned. To this end, we quote Moses in Genesis 17, whom they surely ought to believe if they are true Israelites. When God instituted circumcision, he said, among other things, any uncircumcised male shall be cut off from his people. Genesis seventeen fourteen. With these words, God consigns to condemnation all who are born of flesh, no matter how noble, high, or how low their birth may have been. He does not even exempt from this judgment the seed of Abraham. Although Abraham was not merely of high and noble birth from Noah, but was also a judge holy, Genesis 15, and became Abraham instead of Abram, Genesis 17. Yet none of his children shall be numbered among God's people, but rather shall he rooted out. And God will not be his God unless he, over and above his birth, is also circumcised and accepted into the covenant of God. To be sure, before the world, one person is probably accounted nobler than any other by reason of his birth, or smarter than another because of his intelligence, or stronger and more handsome than another because of his body, or richer and mightier than another in view of his possessions, or better than another on account of his special virtues. For this miserable, sinful, and mortal life must be marked by such differentiation and inequality. The requirements of daily life and the preservation of government make it indispensable. But to strut before God and boast about being so noble, so exalted, and so rich compared to other people, that is devilish arrogance, since every birth according to the flesh is condemned before him without exception in the aforementioned verse, if his covenant and word do not come to the rescue once again and create a new and different birth, quite different from the old first birth. So if the Jews boast in their prayer before God and glory in the fact that they are the patriarch's noble blood, lineage, and children, and that he should regard them and be gracious to them in view of this, while they condemn the Gentiles as ignoble and not of their blood, my dear man, what do you suppose such a prayer will achieve? This is what it will achieve. Even if the Jews were as holy as their fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob themselves, yes, even if they were angels in heaven, on account of such a prayer, they would have to be hurled into the abyss of hell. How much less will such prayers deliver them from their exile and return them to Jerusalem? Sheol. Oh. Sheol. Not hell. Sheol. <laughs> tell, tell that to Luther. This is... <laughs> I, I'm just quoting the man. <laughs> For what does such devilish and arrogant prayer do other than to give God's word the lie? For God declares, whoever is born and not circumcised shall, shall not only he ignoble and worthless, but shall also be damned and shall not be a part of my people, and I will not be his God. The Jews rage against this with their blasphemous prayer, as if to say, No, no, Lord God, that is not true. You must hear us, because we are of the noble lineage of the Holy Fathers. By reason of such noble birth, you must establish us as lords over all the earth and in heaven too. If you fail to do this, you break your word and do us an injustice, since you have sworn to our fathers that you will accept their seed as your people forever. Wow, he's Can we uh, pause for just a second? Uh, you may indeed. Oh, we, we may indeed, yes. <laughs> so, um, to kind of back up just a smidge... Um, the one positive thing that I have seen thus far, one of the things that's really positive is 
Uh, mm-hmm. Luther is actually saying uh, women are people too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And he, um, I think, is kind of referencing Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 of the Bible, where it says, There's neither Jew nor Greek, no slave, no free, no male, no female, for you all mm-hmm. one in Christ Jesus. And Luther actually um, always kind of made that point of the, um, um, the, humanity of women and his ministry and um so yeah that is a he's he's making a a very important point there i think i agree with you Jax. especially for the time um it wasn't until more recently that women were more often than not viewed as people so seeing it this early on especially from luther it's like okay that is nice (laughs) It's nice to see somebody actually saying, no, women are important too, people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's a good point. Good point. Um, but I just wonder, like, again, I just can't help but think that he's he's taking this one prayer that I'm just trying to think, like, I haven't, I haven't looked at, I haven't looked at the link. And I think it'd be good if we did have like a Jewish scholar on here to be able to answer the question, but mm-hmm. how rep- how representative of Jewish thought is this one particular prayer that so, he seems he seems to be railing against? Yeah, Lewis. yes. So what I, I linked to was just an overview of what that prayer book is. And then that mm-hmm. line I did not send a link to. So I'll keep looking and see if I can find specifically that line in the yeah. prayer book. But um, that is mm-hmm. It's a daily prayer that is is commonly prayed. So I'll keep. I'll see if I can find a better, uh, better no. link for that. But no, that's cool. All right. Um, I'll then keep on uh, keep on reading. Then um, no, good, good question is where where was I? Ah, this is just though a king, a prince, a lord, or a rich, handsome, smart, pious, virtuous person among us Christians were to pray thus to God, Lord God. See what a great king and lord I am. See how rich, smart, and pious I am. See what a handsome lad or lass I am in comparison to others. Be gracious to me. Help me. And in view of all this, save me. The other people and the other people are not as deserving because they are not so handsome, rich, smart, pious, noble, or high-born as I am. What do you suppose should such a prayer merit? It would merit that thunder and lightning strike down from heaven and that sulfur and hellfire strike from below. That would be just punishment, for flesh and blood must not boast before God. For as Moses says, whoever is born even from holy patriarchs and from Abraham himself stands condemned before God and must not boast before him. St. Paul says the same thing in Romans 3.27, as does John 3.6. Such a prayer was also spoken by the Pharisee in the gospel as he boasted about all his blessings, saying, I am not like other men. Moreover, his prayer was beautifully adorned since he said it with thanksgiving and fancy that he was sitting on God's lap as his pet child. But thunder and lightning from heaven cast him down to hell's abyss as Christ himself declared, saying that the publican was justified but the Pharisee condemned. Oh, what do we poor muckworms, maggots, stench and filth presume to boast of before him who is the God and creator of heaven and earth, who made us out of dirt and out of nothing? And as far as our nature, birth and essence are concerned, we are but dirt and nothing in his eyes. All that we are and have and have comes from his grace and his rich mercy." Abraham was no doubt even nobler than the Jews. Can, since can, as w- can I interrupt real quick? Um, so he's referencing there a passage of scripture from Luke chapter 18, um, where it tells a story of a Pharisee who's kind of represents like this really good, clean guy that walks mm-hmm. into the temple and he prays something that sounds a lot like the Siddur there. He says, I thank you that I'm not like other men robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. He points over at this tax collector that was like the scum of the earth in in the first century. And and the tax collector, on the other hand, is like, I'm horrible, 
God, forgive me. And like very humbly approaches God. And Jesus then says the, the tax collector walks away redeemed and the, uh, the Pharisee is actually condemned before God. So Luther is taking that story from Jesus and warning people not to trust in how they were born, whether they were born a male, whether they were born Jewish, whatever, however they were born, not to trust in that to get them credit before God. So, mm-hmm. no, yeah, awesome. I know the humility and sorry. No, that's what I was going to say. Thank, thank, you for, thank you for clarifying that point, Lewis. Jax, you were about to say. I was just about to say, yeah, humility is a huge thing, especially for Lutherans even today, being humble and pious. But as a counter, there were some instances in which, just like Luther says, we are but worms, maggot, stench, and filth. Which, at least today, I don't know how it was back then, but definitely in today's world, is Mm -hmm. kind of not great. Um, It was... (laughs) just from my own personal experience um that kind of talk actually reduced my self-esteem and did not help with my depression at the time so i i could definitely see the idea of at least raising yourself up just a little bit so you don't feel like complete garbage (laughs) when you're talking to someone but but no humility is a huge thing uh even now so i can see so, so I can see where this is coming from. Okay, I was going to say because so so how how much uh, how closely to contemporary Lutheran theology does this line up with? Just from your experience being being in the church and uh, being in a, in a Lutheran high school. Uh pretty close. Um, we were regularly taught growing up that we were filthy, we were sinners, and we would never be we would never be good people because we will always sin and we will always fall short of the glory of God and that the only way to redeem ourselves is to accept Jesus and to repent to him on a regular basis of our sins. But we were always filthy unless we repented. And so that did not help. (laughs) It did not help me. (laughs) No, no, this is a, like, um, I also like the other words that ring in my head as you say that are purity culture. As well. Now, I know that's not strictly a, a Lutheran thing. That seems to be more of a um, a, uh, a Protestant, uh, general evangelical kind of thing. But um, yeah, it's just so. Like, to me, I see a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a tie between the two, as well. Like so, like, we, like like we are all sorry, let's like, like we are all filthy, but women sh- women are both filthy and should be subjugated. Yeah, I, I will say um, Luther and Lutheran theology are not necessarily the same. Luther and no. um, L- Lutheran theology was um, transformed a lot by his buddy, uh, Melanchthon, um, after Luther died. Um, Luther actually said he wanted that. Luther said he, he trusted Melanchthon as a Bible scholar more than he trusted himself. So. Like he mm-hmm. basically said, listen to Melanchthon. And so Melanchthon did change a lot of that. Luther's own views, um, Jax, I can definitely see what you're saying there in terms of how that could make you feel horrible. Um, but I don't think he intended it that way. I think what he's basically saying is that we get our sense of worth from God and that if we, if, and I'm sure both of you as atheists would disagree with this, I personally agree with it, is that it, to the extent that we are human, we're reflecting God's image, and that's where our value comes from. And without that, we lose that value. So, in other words, I I think that's what he's saying is that mm-hmm. um, if if you are um, counting on yourself, you are like the worms, right? You're like the dirt. You're like um, material nothing. You're gonna fade away. But if you're attaching yourself to the eternal, you will be eternal and you'll be you know that's i think what he's saying so he's not he's not saying it to hey you should feel bad about yourself or whatever i think he's he's reflecting his own Mm -hmm. theology there so and i am aware of that i'm aware that he's not intentionally being harmful it was it's more of a side effect of saying this stuff over years and years and years just having it drilled into your head that all this stuff eventually it it can get super duper ingrained and that's again i don't think that's his intent i don't think he intended that it's 
unfortunately just kind of how it ended up for some people. Some people are just not, are just going to have to take it that way, which yep, for better or worse. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Um, we are almost at an hour, so I'll maybe go one, maybe one more paragraph and, uh, maybe wrap it for today but um now where where was the uh okay now i'm a i'm a, I'm a doof uh i'm a, now i'm the doofus uh such a <laughs> uh, okay here we go uh such a prayer was also spoken by the pharisee no hold on, i've already done that one you've done that one yes yes abraham uh, yes, okay. was no doubt <laughs> abraham was no doubt even nobler than the jews since as we pointed out above he was descended from the noblest patriarch Noah, who in his day was the greatest and oldest lord, priest, and father of the entire world, and from the other nine succeeding patriarchs. Abraham saw, heard, and lived with all of them, and some of them, as for instance Shem, Shelah, Eber, outlived him by many years. So Abraham obviously was not lacking in nobility of blood and birth, and yet this did not in the least aid him in being numbered among God's people. No, he was idolatrous, and he would have remained under condemnation if God's word had not called him, as Joshua in chapter 24 two informs us out of God's own mouth. Your fathers lived of old beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, and they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him. Even later, as he had been called and sanctified through God's word and through faith, according to Genesis 15, Abraham did not boast of his birth or of his virtues. When he spoke with God, Genesis 18, he did not say, Look how noble I am, born from Noah and the holy patriarchs, and descended from your holy nation. Nor did he say, how pious and holy I am in comparison with the other people. No, he said, Behold, I have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Genesis 18.27 That is, indeed, how a creature must speak to its creator, not forgetting what it, not forgetting what it is before him and how it is regarded by him. For that is what God said of Adam and all his children, Genesis 3.19. You are dust, and to dust you shall return, as death itself persuades us visibly and experientially, to counteract, if need be, any such foolish, vain, and vexatious presumption. Now you can see what fine children of Abraham the Jews really are, how well they take after their father, Yes, what a fine people of God they are. They boast before God of their physical birth and of the noble blood inherited from their fathers, despising all other people, although God regards them in all these respects as dust and ashes and damned by birth the same as all other heathen. And yet, they give God the lie. They insist on being in the right, and with such blasphemous and dam damnable prayer, they purpose to wrest God's grace from him and to regain Jerusalem. He doesn't hold back, does he? Nope. <laughs> no, no, not at all, not at all. Hey, um, Lewis, quick question. Sure. Are you a Bible literalist, a um, allegorical uh, interpretation of the Bible, or some mix of the two? Um, so I believe that the Bible should be interpreted as the author is intended. Um, so I um, would certainly take some parts as literal and some parts as metaphor and some parts as um, uh, allegorical, um, just, yeah, depending on mm -hmm. what, what the author intended. Um, but I'm, I'm definitely, if your question is, am I a conservative that believes in miracles? I would say yes. I Conservative actually, theolo theologically, yes. So. Actually, that wasn't where I was going with that. Where I was going okay. with that was, um, it's mentioned here that Luther believed that Abraham lived for the full 900 years that the Bible claims that he lived. So I was curious if you thought the same or if you were a little different on that. Um, I do, I find the long lifespans of many of the patriarchs to be a very interesting thing. And I certainly would say it's 
true in the light of scripture as being the truth. Um, I don't know if I, I, I don't I can't really explain it other than just to say I, I, I would take scripture for what it is. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know if they counted some things differently or whatever, or if they just had longer mm-hmm. lifespans back then. Um, I, it's honestly not something I've spent a lot of time thinking about other than I, I would, I'm someone that would take scripture as true. So if, mm-hmm. you know, if, if, if that's what the author intended, that's certainly what I would, I would take to be true. I asked because I know that um, there was a different Jewish calendar for a long time. And so I don't, I personally nowadays don't think that Abraham was actually 900 years old. It, it was more based off of, I, if I remember correctly, I think it was based more on a lunar cycle. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. possible he lived closer to like 70 ish years, which is still a long time for those days. <laughs> Probably felt yeah. like 900 years, but <laughs> yeah, I, I actually can't answer that question. Other than I, it is true that Jewish people to this day follow a lunar calendar. Um, but I don't know if that explains the, the, um, long lifespans or, or not, but, um, I, I'm, I'm certainly open to the idea that some people somewhere had very long lifespans, maybe miraculously, um, through God's, uh, preservation or whatever but um I, it's certainly possible fair enough i was curious because when i was growing up we we were taught that abraham was literally 900 years old so i was i was just yeah. curious what you thought on that so thank you and, and that's like the um the old thing about uh goliath you know was he really nine feet tall or was he six well? feet and was he six feet tall <laughs> like the uh, dead sea scrolls say yeah indeed indeed it's um it, it's interesting that um can I say a quick uh, aside on, uh, no, on, Goliath, on Goliath? Um, if you, I don't know if either of you are Malcolm Gladwell fans, um, but he no. has a very, very good book called, um, David and Goliath, um, that is about kind of, um, the underdog and how the underdog often is actually victorious, but he has a, a interesting intro on David and Goliath where he talks about that and he talks, he takes it very literally, um, even though it's not a religious book at all, but he basically says that. There's a lot of indicators in the text of the story of David and Goliath that indicate that Goliath had some form of giantism that made uh-huh. him extremely tall. And like, if you remember from that story, Goliath says things like, um, uh, come close to me. He says things like, you know, am I a dog where you would come out with me with sticks? Um, and he's he's saying things that indicate his eyesight's bad. Um, the Bible talks about him having more than 10 fingers. And like, there's a lot of things that would indicate he had some kind of genetic giantism. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so I, I just find it kind of interesting. So maybe he was extremely tall, like maybe he was eight, nine feet tall. Um, and as, as a result of some kind of genetic uh, disorder. So. Interesting. Uh, let, yeah. let me think. I think the top, yeah, the tallest person with giantism was eight foot eleven inches. Yeah, Robert so pretty Wadlow. close. Yeah, Robert, Robert Wadlow. However, I wouldn't uh, pick Robert Wadlow in a fight. If you look at how gangly <laughs> and how, because apparently he died at about uh, in his in his twenties because of uh, of infections and all that from his uh, from his giantism. Yeah, from his giantism, yeah. Anyway, um, so that's I, a debate we can have another time. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, anyway, I think before our next uh, episode, I might see if I can actually get a couple of uh, what, maybe one or two Jewish people to come on, and so they can give the Jewish interpretation of what uh, Luther is uh, is railing. But anyway, that, that's that's an aside. Um, anyway, so I think we'll end we'll end the episode here. It has been an hour, so uh, I'll let you go back to your normal lives. Um, but anyway, what Lewis, normal life? J- <laughs> it, like like Jax, I know I know you'll you'll be on Discord afterwards anyway, so well, excuse me, I'm gonna be reading my visual novel. Hmm. <laughs> oh well. And Lewis, um yeah. Anyway, Lewis, Jax, thank you for joining me for reading On the Jews and Their Lies by Martin Luther. Your thoughts and insight are invaluable. Uh very, very good to have you both on. But anyway, uh, to any of you listening and watching, wherever you happen to be, wherever you happen to be, whatever time of day it is, have a great rest of the day. Look after yourselves. Stay safe. My name is Damien from the Tall Friendly Atheist Ed Podcast. On behalf of Lewis, uh, lewisungit.com, and Jax, uh, that underscore 126 at, over at TikTok, have a great night and look after yourselves. Have a good one. Hey, thanks so much.